Hey guys, Quiv, the Lazy Geek here, and today we're going to keep talking about starting astrophotography, but for lazy people. So we're going to introduce like the different parts that you need and how they relate to each other and what our overriding principle of being lazy means with regards to those parts. So let's get started. I have here one example of a setup. I have a second one that I will show a bit later in detail as well. And this is a very simple uh, setup nope not really but it is a very typical setup uh, with you know the first part that people imagine and look at is the big white tube there that's a telescope that's one type of a telescope it's called the Newtonian telescope it has uh, basically two mirrors in there and then a lens that corrects some aberrations we can go to that uh, later on we the telescope itself is connected uh, via here all the light from the telescope goes to this area here and we have a way to focus to change like the distance between uh, our eye or the sensor of the camera and uh, the mirror so we we can check focus just like you would do with a standard camera lens or binoculars you, you turn a knob and you get into focus and then we have various things in there that connect in the end to a camera. The red thing here is the camera. It's a specific astrophotography camera. Um, its specificity is that it is cooled. You can cool the sensor of this camera. And I will explain why it is lazy to cool the sensor of this camera um, if you want to be lazy. So we'll get to that uh, later. You can see the black thing I have here as well is a filter wheel you can actually in astrophotography instead of using standard you know color cameras like you would typically do in normal photography you can use monochrome cameras this particular camera is a color camera uh, but i could replace it with a monochrome camera which i also own and uh, and then have filters in here and for example if i want to get to get um color data out of a monochrome camera, I can take a picture of the same object, the same galaxy, the same nebula, the same star, whatever, uh, with red, green, and blue filters, each one after the other. And if I want to take pictures like the Hubble telescope usually does or often does on nebulae, I can use uh, filters that do not target the, the colors that we as humans perceive, but that targets what is called emission bands. So many nebulas, they will emit light of certain colors in majority. And this is linked to the um, atoms, the actual uh, way the nebula is built so a lot of them will emit in what we call h alpha sulfur 2 and uh, oxygen 3 frequencies and the hubble telescope the hubble space telescope uses that and we can do that as well within this filter wheel i have filters for those three hydrogen hydrogen alpha which is usually abbreviated to h a or h alpha uh, sulfur 2, which is usually uh, abbreviated to S2, and oxygen 3, which is often abbreviated to O3. But this is more, this kind of uh, astrophotography is much better for uh, people who are in the city, uh, like me here in Tokyo. <laughs> so you can really do astrophotography from anywhere. If, you can, if I can do it here for deep sky, deep sky objects, so like nebula, uh, and very you know low brightness objects you can probably do it anywhere um, so that's like one of the pieces of equipment that we have here you'll notice that i have some weird stuff also besides the filler wheel and the camera this is because we need typically to get exactly a distance a correct distance between the telescope and the camera because there are some optical elements that like to be exactly at a perfect distance from the camera and that's probably one of the biggest headaches when you're getting started in astrophotography now on top of that you might have noticed i have a little red thing here this little red box is a focusing motor it's actually connected to um, this knob here and instead of me having to no to turn the knob manually i can have this little box there that can turn the knob for me so what's the point you tell me well the point is to be lazy because then i don't have to be outside next to the telescope to actually get my uh, camera in focus i can simply control that remotely because this little thing is controlled via usb 
And you might notice I have a little box there, which is a, a computer. It's an actual computer connected to my home network and I can access it via remote desktop applications. So again, override, overriding principle, we want to be lazy with our setup once it is built. It does not mean that you want to be lazy while you, build, or you, while you choose or build your setup, but in the end, we should be able to have everything pretty much optimized and automated so that uh, doing a, an astrophotography session would be like 10 minutes of work. So. This focuser is an important part of that. Another reason you want to have this uh, in general is because um, the focus will change a little bit throughout the night. The reason is this tube is, uh, is, not, uh, is metal and metal can expand or contract with uh, changes in temperature. And uh, that expansion or contraction, even of several microns, so one thousandth of a millimeter can affect the perfect focus on your camera and you're extremely sensitive to focus in astrophotography so we really want that and we really want software that can do autofocus for, for us throughout the night and uh, so that's some of the challenges there um, the camera and the telescope together they're matched they're linked together because they together determine how much you zoom into a picture uh, or what we call the field of view uh, which is expressed in degrees or arc minutes and arc seconds and i'll go to that in another video and uh, it also affects what is called the resolution uh, the resolution is determined by not only how much the telescope zooms are its focal lengths for people who are familiar with uh, photography and but it also affects together with the size of the pixels within your camera sensor the resolution of your camera and then there's actually a maximum resolution that you can get that's determined by both your telescope and the atmosphere <laughs> Because the atmosphere moves around and uh, it's called that phenomenon is called seeing and if it moves around lots it blurs out all the small details in which case you don't need to have very f small pixels and you do not need to have uh, a very like large telescope that zooms a lot because even if you zoom in it's blurry because of the atmosphere so there's no detail to be had and in general if you're trying to capture as much light as possible and that's what we try to do when we're photographing very faint deep sky objects you want to have larger pixels because larger pixels they'll have more photons rain on them from your targets so they are actually uh, more sensitive and they collect more signal in a shorter amount of time we can see that things will get complicated very quickly in this series uh, but I will try to explain step by step everything of that I'm just giving you an idea right now of the different challenges that we face when choosing our equipment so we can see that the camera and the telescope they're linked we have to consider them together when we're choosing our equipment there's Another thing then that is linked to your, um, your camera and your telescope, which is this thing, the mount. Uh, and the mount is extremely important and it's very often one of, one of the biggest sources of frustration in astrophotography. The mount's role is basically to rotate at roughly 0 0.5 deg 0 0.25 degrees per minute that's all it does and yet and yet it is very complicated and why is it complicated so let's first explain how this works if i take uh, this mount you can see that i can rotate this telescope like this left and right and what does this do it's basically uh rotating against the rotation of the earth so you might have noticed that the sun uh, like will rise and will set in different uh, directions or in different, di uh, different areas of the sky and that it travels throughout the sky across the day. Of course, the stars do exactly the same. So when we do an exposure, 
uh, we need to track those stars. And you'd be very surprised at high zoom levels, how even with a one second or even like half a second exposure, your stars will have moved while you're exposing and you actually see not a dot for the star, but a star streak. So we need to follow that very precisely. It's akin to, try, to trying to take a picture of a, a dime or a small coin that's traveling in a car that's going 40 miles an hour or 60 kilometers an hour. Uh, that's like a mile away or 1.5 kilometers away. So it's like extremely it's an exp extremely high precision task that this mount has to do. And the mount itself, it's very much related to the telescope because if the telescope and the camera have a high resolution and your atmospheric seeing, how blurry the atmosphere makes your object supports it, then you could have a very high resolution and you mean you, if you have a very high resolution, you want to have a very high amount of precision on the mount. Plus, the mount has, is rated for a certain weight that it can carry. If your equipment weighs more than that, and actually for, astrophotogra for art, astro astrophotography, if your equipment means, uh, weighs more than half of the rated weight of, um, that the mount can carry, you're going to run into issues typically. <laughs> wow, so things are getting more and more complex, but don't worry. We'll get through each of those. Again, I'm just setting out the problems. So you can see that because of the weight of the equipment here, but also the width of the equipment, because the larger, the more what we call moment arm the equipment can have, and the more sensitive to wind the equipment is. Uh, wind is another big source of frustration in astrophotography because we're trying to take very precise uh, pictures of stars. We're taking very long exposures, typically like 30 seconds or more, uh, exposure at a time and wind can ruin an exposure very quickly by making this shake even this me doing this on this telescope would completely ruin an exposure very very quickly it's extremely sen sensitive i'll even tell you that when i have trucks that go on the road right next to my house um, the vibrations from those trucks will affect my imaging up to this roof balcony here so it's completely crazy how sensitive to, you need to be now this mount how it works you can see there's a there's the axis that the mount basically turns across it that axis is pointed to the celestial pole so it's pointing to the north pole for me basically the north pole of the sky basically it's it's parallel to the axis of rotation of the earth the earth uh, rotates around a certain axis we are parallel to that axis and we'll we'll be moving against the the earth's rotation so we're following the stars extremely precisely so you can see that one of the challenges that you'll have also when setting up your equipment will be to very precisely align your mount to the earth's rotation axis and just to make things a bit more funny the earth the earth, the earth uh, rotation axis changes with time. It changes very slowly and it's very little change, but it can affect your photography. Woohoo! So things get more and more complex the more you start looking into the details. Fun stuff. So we've seen that the camera, the telescope, and the mount are all linked together. When you want to choose a camera, you need to think about the telescope. When you want to choose a telescope, you need to th think about the mount. When you choose a mount, you need to think about the telescope and the camera. E everything is related. And on top of that, I, me I mentioned how you know you, the mount tracking needs to be extremely precise, like, but really extremely precise. And the mount on its own typically cannot be that precise. Uh, if you want to have precise mounts that can track stars perfectly, absolutely perfectly, without any outside help, you'll need to really spend $5,000 or more on this mount. Um, even like typically more than five thousand dollars i don't think you can go as cheap as five thousand which is completely you know crazy um and then we have at the top of the scope here you might see there's another an, another little telescope there what is this little telescope for it is uh what is called an auto guiding telescope and so it's an additional telescope that you mount on top of your main telescope or side by side the point being that you want it to have basically the same movement as your telescope and this little guy 
has a little camera here, that red thing at the end, that's also connected via USB. Like this focuser, this camera, this filter wheel, this camera, everything, and the mount as well, everything is linked back to the computer at the end. So everything is, com is connected to the computer, and this little camera, uh, along with this telescope, will identify a star, and it will track that star, and it tracks it with uh, what we call sub-pixel precision. So it can actually, it, it will look at the size of the star, it's, it's typically a little sphere, uh, yeah, a little disk around multiple uh, pixel, across multiple pixels, it, it will compute the center of that disk, and it will keep tracking the center of that disk with sub-pixel ac accuracy. And if it sees that the star is deviating from where it should be, well, the computer will, that is analyzing all of the images from that camera will actually tell the mount, like, hey, dude, you're, you're going off track, you should go a bit faster in this direction or a bit slower in this direction. <laughs> so you can see there is a feedback loop going on between this to the mount via the computer. So, it gets really complicated. But again, auto-guiding is something that you absolutely want to have if you want to be lazy and you do want to be lazy. If you want to do astrophotography without guiding, you do not want to have a very high resolution telescope and camera. If you have a very low resolution telescope and camera, then you can afford more tracking errors from the mount and then you could do without that guide scope. The guide scope has another advantage, uh, although it can be done by the mount alone, is that it makes an operation that we call dithering, which basically makes the, the quality of your astrophotogra of, uh, astro images better. Um, and so it's, it, it enables that to be, uh, to be very easy. So we're seeing all of the parts of that equi equipment. We have the mount, the focuser, the telescope, the camera, a potential filter wheel, um, a guide scope, a guide camera, um, the tripod, of course, and the computer. And all of this is being, um, uh, is getting energy. So most of the um, astrophotography that equipment that you'll see needs 12 volts. So this is 12 volts. This camera takes 12 volts. Um, and this mount takes 12 volts as well. And so when you go uh, do astrophotography like outside of your house, you can bring a 12 volt battery to basically have everything on the same uh, voltage. You can see uh, my, my, my setup is very janky, but I have a, a splitter here that uh, gives 12 volts to the whole equipment. Now, you might have noticed something else that we need and that you will definitely need if you go with um, a, a, what we call a refracting telescope or basically it's just like a camera lens but longer and uh, optimized to focus at infinity where basically the stars are you'll need something like this this is a dew heater it's basically heating the lens of my auto guider here and it actually has a sensor in this little box that tracks the temperature and uh, that, that tracks the outside temperature and will heat my lens here more than the outside uh, temperature. And the reason for that is that it avoids dew formation. When the air is humid, the glass on your telescope lens will cool down very quickly. And uh, by cooling them down very quickly, it will also cool down the air around it. Colder air can contain less humidity, less water than uh, warmer air. So by cooling the air right around the lens, because the lens has become cold itself, dew, so small water droplets, will form on your camera lens or on your telescope or on your autoguider lens, which means that you want to heat your lens up to prevent exactly that. Ha! <sighs> Another layer of complication. Uh, but it is something that I would highly recommend for any like lazy setup. Then, the final piece of the puzzle that I have is this. This is a telescope cover. I can put it on top of the telescope when I'm not using it, which means that I do not need to reset everything up, including the polar alignment, the alignment of this mount in to, to, parallel, to being parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. I can leave it here forever and ever without bothering. This will be rainproof, windproof, everything proof, except maybe typhoon. The only time is when a typhoon comes, I will be putting that inside. Um, I did not do it the first time, and it was with a different piece of equipment. This 
whole thing, which, which weighs a ton, got toppled down by the wind. So, uh, yeah, something to keep in mind. And with that cover, you want to use the second to avoid like uh, humidity forming all over uh, the equipment, which uh, is something that I detail in another video. Now, let's have a look at this little setup there. This is my portable setup. And it's pretty much exactly the same as this, except miniaturized. So we have a mount here, which is uh, which can rotate around the axis that's parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. We have a camera, that red thing here. I have a filter somewhere in these adapters here. I have actually this uh, little piece there is an autofocuser. It will control the focusing motor that's within this camera lens, which is a Sigma Canon uh, lens, 135 millimeters f1.8. I have my dew heater there to avoid uh, dew uh, or water forming on the lens while I'm imaging. I have another little camera here connected to a little uh, telescope here that is my guide scope and my guide camera. We're seeing all of the same elements. This is pretty much equivalent to that, except that this is a much lower resolution and a much like error tolerant kind of, uh, of setup. Okay, so I think that's uh, good for an overview of what is needed and why it is needed. I will go into more detail on each piece with, again, the overriding principle that we'll have is we want to be lazy in the end. We don't want to have to um, mess with the equipment after we've done the original setup. The original setup will be work. Afterwards, it should be frustration free. And that is our objective. So hopefully this video has been a good introduction to you about what is needed for astrophotography. Uh, if you like this video, please click like. Please also subscribe to not miss the next vi videos in this series. And I think there will be a lot of them. <laughs> because there's ton to ex tons to explain and um, you know don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.